Friends, in our past two lectures, we've looked at two strategies that the Quran uses to convince its audience to believe in God and to believe in God's messengers or prophets. In the first lecture, the one that we gave in front of the Dead Sea, we spoke about the punishment stories. There the Quran seems to say that people in the past have been destroyed by not believing in God. Won't you make a better decision? And in the following lecture, the most recent lecture, we spoke about the details of heaven and hell. Both of these strategies the Quran uses rely on calling on the audience's self-interest, concern for their own welfare, both during this life and the next life. We've called this approach using the Arabic phrase targhib wa tarhib, arousing desire and instilling fear. But the Quran also has other passages which seem to rely on a different sort of strategy. That is, the Quran does not only rely on the self-interest of its audience for their own preservation and their hope to go to heaven. The Quran also asks its audience to think of the ways in which God has already blessed them, has already given them blessings, and to respond accordingly. The Quran, in other words, in these passages, seems to call not on the self-interest, but rather on the conscience of its audience. It's as though the Quran in these passages which involve descriptions of the blessings of God in nature. It's as though the Quran is saying to its audience, God has been good to you. God has given you good things in nature, including the sky, the rain, the seas, the trees, the fruit of the trees. God has given you all of this. The Creator has made these things. How will you respond to the Creator? Will you deny Him or will you respond in gratitude? Will you believe in Him or will you be an ingrate? We can look at some examples of the Qur'an which speak of these, these blessings of nature. One special place to see this is in a surah we've already read from, Surah 55, which of course has its refrain, its nice refrain, so which of your Lord's marvels will you deny? Here, beginning in verse 10, the Qur'an speaks of these blessings that God has given in nature. I read, And the earth he set up for the creatures, in it are fruits, and palms and clusters, and grains in the blades, and fragrant plants. So which of your Lord's marvels will you deny? He created man from hard clay, like bricks, and he created the jinn, and we'll get back to who the jinn are, the genies of the Quran, from a fusion of fire. So which of your Lord's marvels will you deny? Lord of the two east, and Lord of the two west, so which of your Lord's marvels will you deny? He merged the two seas, converging together, between them is a barrier which they do not overrun. So which of your Lord's marvels will you deny? Here we have then this general description of things in nature, including the seas and trees and fruit of trees. And the Quran appealing to its audience, saying, do not deny the things that God has done. In other passages, however, we see the Quran again pointing to nature, but for a different sort of argument. In these passages, the Quran looks at nature as a, a source, or rather something that can be observed, which proves the resurrection of the body, which gives witness to this fundamental religious doctrine of the Quran, that not only the soul will be brought up to heaven, but the body will be resurrected. In order to make this point, the Quran speaks about unbelievers who deny this. The Quran references unbelievers. Now, these may in fact be real unbelievers who quoted these exact things. The Quran might be quoting unbelievers. Or, and maybe more likely, it might be speaking hypothetically of what unbelievers might say. The Quran says now in Surah 50, beginning in verse 2, they marveled that a warner has come to them from among them. The disbelievers say, this is something strange. When we have died and become dust, this is a far-fetched return. And the Quran responds, we know what the earth consumes of them, and with us is a comprehensive book. But they denied the truth when it has come to them. The Qur'an then turns to nature, beginning in verse 6. I've sort of skipped ahead here. Have they not observed the sky above them, how we constructed it and decorated it, and it has no cracks? Here the Qur'an seems to have a particular cosmology where the sky is something like a solid dome which arches above the earth. And this is why the Qur'an seems to say it has no cracks, the sky has no cracks. It's mentioning the quality of this smooth dome. It continues, verse 7, In the earth how we spread it out, and set on it mountains, and grew in it all kinds of delightful pears, a lesson and reminder for penitent worshiper. So here we see a general description of heaven. But look what happens beginning in verse 9. And we brought down from the sky blessed water, 
and produced with it gardens and grain to harvest, and the soaring palm trees and clustered dates, as sustenance for the servants. And we revive thereby a dead town, verse 11. Likewise is a resurrection. Friends, you see what the Quran is doing here. It's saying, observe a dead town, meaning a barren land. What happens to it when God rains or send rains upon it? It comes back to life. This is an example, so says the Quran, for God's power to do the same thing with the dry bones of a dead human. That God could take those dry bones and just as it brings a dead land back to life, bring, bring this body back to life for judgment. There's sort of a precedent for the Quran's interest in nature, in using nature to make an argument about God in the biblical book, the book of Job. When the Quran points all of, out the wonders of God's creation, we find that a passage of Job does the same thing. Beginning in Job 38, which is a famous passage in the Bible, where God appears out of the whirlwind, God convinces Job not to question his actions by describing his wonders in nature. For example, 38 verse 4, God says to Job, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, God is saying, if you're so smart, or who stretched a line upon it, or what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Up to verse 7. But the Quran and Job are different. The author of the book of Job means to describe the superior might and knowledge of God. The author of the Quran means to describe by mentioning nature, not simply God's might or God's power, but the way that God's blessings in nature serve man. In this way, we can detect that the Quran has a special interest in appealing to human conscience or human gratitude to look at nature, observe God's blessings, and to respond with gratitude. In this regard, it is interesting to note that the Quran has its opponents admit that God is the creator. You might even say admit that Allah is the creator, the God of the Quran. In chapter 29, verse 61, we read, And if you ask them, that is, if you ask the unbelievers, who created the heavens and the earth and regulated the sun and the moon, they would say, God, Allah. Why then do they deviate? The problem of unbelief then is not always, according to the Quran, a simple case of ignorance or denial of God. The unbelievers, in this passage at least, seem to know that the God of the Quran, Allah, is the creator. The problem of unbelief is a problem of obedience and gratitude. The unbelievers refuse to obey God and to worship Him alone. They refuse, in other words, to listen to the voice of their conscience.